Number seven ministries. The spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release. The oppressed number seven ministries. Welcome everyone to number seven ministries Christian outreach. Today's sermon is called In the Midst of Perversion, but Not Perverted. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt, they did not know the Lord. And the background of what's taking place is you have Eli, who was the head priest of the temple of God, and you have good, well-meaning, obedient people of God who were taking their offerings and they were bringing them into the house of the Lord. Now, back then in the biblical times, in the days of Israel, the days of the Jewish folks, there were um, animal offerings, animal sacrifice as an atonement, a covering of their sins. Now we have Jesus Christ to cover our sins. But also back then, too, God also wanted folks to pay 10% of their income, and they often did it by spices. They often did it with their animals. They did it with a lot of different parts. So this was referring to not an atonement for their sin but just an offering bringing an offering to the people of uh to the house of god and these people were doing it and in god's eyes the people were fine but in god's eyes the priests the ch the sons of eli the head of the house of god his children or pastor's kids if you will they were taking the offerings and they were using it for themselves they were um really corrupting the offering and it says that at the last sentence that god was abhorred god was very angry at what they were doing and that was just one thing that was just one thing these uh pastor's kids or the children of Eli, they were also sleeping with the women in the house of God. They were committing adultery, fornication, and God was looking at this and God was running out of patience with what was going on in this practice. And then on top of it, the pastor or Eli, he knew what his children were doing and he continued to allow them to do it. And so not, now Eli wasn't doing this, but his children were. And so God was angry with Eli and his children for allowing his children to defile the house of God. Now, I'll tell you, um, this is the thing. If you as a Christian and you practice uh, tithes and offerings and you believe in tithes and offerings, look at this. If you have faith to give your money to the house of God, right, and God will honor your faith, he will bless it. He will bless it. But check this out. If your money that you give to a church out of obedience to the word of God, if your money is taken by the pastor and used and abused and not distributed properly, it doesn't go towards the rent, to the bill, to the ministry, he uses it for his own personal gain. And I'm not talking about paying a pastor's salary. I'm just talking about just being abusive with the money, even using the money to buy prostitutes or using the money to buy drugs or using the money to do wicked things, using the money to gamble, to steal, cheat, and uh, hurt people. God will not judge you for what the pastor is doing. God will honor you for your act of faith, and God will judge the pastor of that house that you've given the money to. See, once we give, God doesn't, he doesn't look at what, where our money goes to. He doesn't like track our money that the, the, the pastor puts the money in the church account. The uh, lawyers that work for the church, they take the money and they give it to another corporation and that corporation, they distribute that same money with the serial number on it and they buy cocaine and God judges you for what other folks did. God doesn't operate like that. 
he judges each of us individually for what we do. Now, on the same sense, if you give your money to the house of God and the pastor uses it to feed the poor, he uses it to sustain the ministry, and that money goes into the bank, and then the bank takes the money, and they invest it in uh, distributing it to charities. You don't get a blessing for what other people did. It doesn't work either side of the fence, whether they do good things or bad things. God just honors us for what we do. So here you have uh, Eli and his sons um, just committing abominations. And the title of this message is, In the Midst of Perversion and Not Perverted. Sometimes God will place us in a place where it's not all peaches, rainbows, and butterflies, and not everyone is serving God. Not everyone is a saint. Not everyone is an angel. Not everyone is doing the right thing. And God will send you there anyways. Because oftentimes, we might be the only witness. We might be the only light in that particular dark place. And that's where we're the most needed. God sends us out where we're needed. And God sent Samuel where he was needed. In a corrupt temple of God. That's where God sent them. He didn't send them to, again, there were other temples that were obeying God. There were other temples that were doing the right thing. There were other temples that were pleasing God. There were other temples where the priests and the pastors weren't taking the offerings and using it for selfish gain and taking it by force. And if you read there, it says that they took it by force. In other words, the people even knew how the offering was supposed to be taken. And it says that the priests took it by force. And God, God was getting ready to judge. And actually, he did judge. In Samuel chapter 3, verses 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And I believe just, back, just as it was back in this day that the Bible verse says that the word of the Lord was rare. I believe in 2013, in today's times, I believe the word of the Lord is rare in today's times too. It's not very often that you can go to a lot of different places and people are just praising Jesus and people are thankful, people are appreciative, people are just uh, giving God all the glory for the blessings of their life. Usually, What's going on now is you don't hear a lot of folks talking about Jesus. Now it's, you have to be politically correct. Now you can't pray in school. Now you can't worship in school. Now uh, it's okay to marry homosexuals. Now they're calling good evil and evil good. The word of the Lord is rare. And if you can find somewhere or a place that is distributed freely the word of the Lord, you better hold fast to that place. But here you have Samuel. He was in this temple of God and there was all kinds of corruption going on around him. The people were abusing the offering. They were sinning hellaciously. But yet God, in his infinite power and wisdom, he was able to preserve Samuel. He was able to keep Samuel pure. And I know that there are a lot of people who feel like they need to be surrounded always by innocent people, by pure people, by people who don't swear, don't smoke, don't drink, aren't doing anything wrong. And they feel like unless they're around that atmosphere, they can't be pure. But I come to tell you that when God has covered your sins, when you are purified by the blood of Jesus Christ, by you, when you are being led by the Holy Spirit, the sins of other people cannot come on you. God will protect you from it. And often he sends us in those places as a witness. As I was doing this message, I was reminded of a time when I was in jail. When I was in prison, actually. And in prison, they, they had this program designed by a bunch of psychologists in the prison to help the inmates. And to their credit, it actually did work temporarily. As long as these inmates were dependent and following the program, and the, it was called therapeutic community. 
And they would establish this awesome community where you literally couldn't smoke. You had to make your bed real proper and tight. Um, if you saw someone else doing something wrong, you had to report them. Or if someone else saw you seeing someone else doing something wrong and you didn't report them, they could report you for not reporting someone else. And they would literally run around writing tickets to one another, and there were consequences. So it was almost like... Uh, I don't even know, the Gestapo police, you know, like the, uh, the Al-Qaeda. I mean, just it was, it was a very oppressive program. But it worked. It, it really worked temporarily. And God told me to get out of that fake atmosphere. And although these inmates seemed to be doing good because of their atmosphere did affect them, it did affect them because they were trying to fit in with the atmosphere. But there's a problem with our human nature that as we try to fit in with our atmosphere, what happens if our atmosphere changes in a bad way? Then we continue to fit in with that atmosphere, and then we become corrupted like everyone else. God said, get out of that program. Because what I did, I changed inside of you. I changed your heart. I changed your mind. I changed your spirit and your soul. And nobody's going to get the glory for what I did in your life. And then I tried to do the AA programs. I tried to do the NA programs. I tried to do these uh, counseling programs. And God told me I didn't want you to do those things either because I did not want anyone to get the glory of what you were doing. So then after, two years later, I saw some of these same people in the therapeutic program walking down the street, drunk as a skunk, stumbling. And these were some of the leaders in that therapeutic program. And I looked at them. They looked at me. I had my Bible. I was walking out of church. And they, they were so ashamed they couldn't even look me in the eyes or say hi. And they walked away. And then I saw these same people in the same program in, back in jail. So God wants to change us so that we will be able to be in the midst of perversion and not be perverted. That's how God, he wants to do it to our heart, to our mind, and our soul. In Genesis chapter 6 verses 4 through 8, Nephilim, uh, from my understanding, is these are hybrids. They were um, half demon, half man, and they were giants. You heard of Goliath? They say Goliath was a Nephilim. Um, basically, they're, demon, they're demons, but in a uh, human body. Like, they're combinations. When God kicked the angels out of heaven and he sent them down to the earth, they, they started breeding. They started breeding with the women, and they were creating monsters back then. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of King Benjamin, they had children. So when it's saying the sons of God, it's not talking about children of God, Christians, good Israel people. It's talking about the Nephilim. It's talking about the demon-possessed people. But go ahead. Okay, I want to stop right there. The Bible is saying that these demon-possessed people were the heroes of renown back then. In other words, because of their stature, because of their physical, natural power, possibly even because of their intelligence, because of their persuasion, because of their looks, because of how tall they were, they were heroes. In other words, these demon-possessed people, because of their outward appearance, they were being worshipped. And it was an abomination in God's eyes. And I come to tell you today that we have the same thing going on in this planet right now. You have demon-possessed people that are being idolized in worship. You have musicians that are singing corrupt, evil, satanic music, openly blatant Satanism. And you have masses of massive millions of people all over the world worshiping them and just marching to their beat. You you have actors who are involved in pornography that become superstars and they're being worshipped all over the earth. Demon possessed people, whether it be a hybrid of half demon, half human, or whether it just be a full bred human that has demons inside of them, this is what's taking place. And let's look at how that works out back in that day. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, 
It says, the Lord saw how wicked the human race had become. In other words, the humans didn't start off like that. They became like that. They evolved like that. They started off one way and ended up another way. See, if we don't see God with all our heart, we don't repent and we don't see God, we will be just like them. We will become like these demons. Okay, the Bible says that God regretted making human. That's a disturbing Bible verse, you know. Could you imagine just for whatever reason your natural father had regretted making you? I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about your natural father. Can you imagine how that will make a child feel that the, 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 the child knows or finds out or discovers that his father regretted that his son was ever even born or that he even came into this earth? That is a horrible feeling. Well, I'm going to tell you, if it's that way in the natural, how much more if we know as people that our heavenly father regretted making mankind? That is a rotten feeling. That is a rotten feeling. And I'll tell you that God is pleased with us, the bride of Christ, the church. But those who reject Jesus, who are involved in abominable sins, who are using the church for selfish gain, using the church to commit sin, who are committing all types of murders and rapes and child molestation, you don't think God regrets What's going on? God is terribly grieved. And I'm going to tell you that in the spiritual realm, God has something to prove. Now I will ask you, what does God have to prove? And I know a lot of folks would say, God don't have nothing to prove. Yes, he does. God has something to prove. He is proving to Satan that we, the children of God, love God more than we love Satan. And Satan is trying to prove that people love him more or his things or his devices or his sin. He is trying to prove that people love Satan more than God. And that is a spiritual war going on after our heart. Who loves who more? And you can see this proving take place in the story of Job. God was saying, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright. And saying, saying, yeah, but he only loves you because you've given him all these things. And God proved to Satan and to us that Job loved God even when the things were taken away, even when he lost everything. And I'll tell you, the same thing is going on. Job grew up in the midst of perversion, but he wasn't perverted. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was willing to take the persecution, the ridicule, the rejection of mankind. And Noah grew up in the midst of perversion. All this demonic activity was going around. A demon sleeping with the women. All kinds of fornication, adultery, drunkenness, pagan worship, just complete evil was going on. It was going on when, jo when, when Noah was right there in the midst of it. God didn't stop the atmosphere. He didn't create a community to be perfect for Noah. God allowed them. God permitted them to continue in their evil, but he gave a time limit where these people need to either get on the ark or be destroyed. And while Noah was busy serving God and doing what God told him to do, in spite of being the only household, he was able to be in the midst of perversion and not perverted. So one of the secrets for us as the children of God to be able to operate in the midst of perversion and not be perverted ourselves is to be doing the will of God. If we're busy doing the will of God, then we will not be perverted. Even though there's corruption all around us, 
It'll be all around us, but we will be a witness. We will be a light. We may be the only hope that other people have. See, some folks, they want to know that there is somewhere or someone still existing on this planet who's serving God in the event that they decide to leave their sin and follow God. They want to see an example of a place to still go to. Some people may never go, but they want to feel comfort and the option of having somewhere to go to. No one wants to know that evil is everywhere and they run out of places to go to. See, there are a lot of folks that will never come to church, but they want to know they can if they ever so choose to. But the problem is we don't know when we're checking out. I'll tell you, yesterday I truly, truly almost died again on my motorcycle yesterday. I was riding at about 3 to 4 p.m. daytime. I was going right through Pearl Road and bit off intersection. I was riding through it. I had a green light. It was green as green can go. They say go green. I was going green. It was green. And it wasn't just changing green. It was green. It's been green. It was green a half a mile before I saw the green. And it maintained green. And as I was going through the green light, a big van pulled in front of him, through his red light, which it was red as blood. Stop. And he did go. He went through the red light and he parked his van in the middle of the intersection when I was, it would have been like me running into a brick wall. And I wasn't speeding, I was doing 40 miles per hour in a 35. And I literally slammed on both brakes and I was, my front tire was inches away from his van. And I hit both brakes and literally both of my tires screeched so loud and I skid almost hitting his van. And had I only used one brake, I would have crashed into the van. And then as I stop and I'm like, my, first of all, I was a little bit tired. How many of you know I woke up? When that happened, I, I, endorphins were releasing, adrenaline. I was, it was if I felt like I drank a, a shot of a pot of coffee, like they do in the hospital with the IVs and the sugar water. I felt like I had an IV of coffee. My eyes were big, and the guy went like this. He threw his hands up in the air. He was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And yes, I'm a sanctified Christian. Yes, I love Jesus. But how many know I was not feeling love towards this individual? I wasn't feeling friendly. I didn't even invite him to the church. I didn't hand him my card and say, we'd like to have you in the church. We would love to see you. I did not do none of those things. You know what I did? I held my peace. I didn't say anything. I looked around just to make sure it was still safe. The man backed up his van and he just threw his hands. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I just had another uh, blessed opportunity to forgive him. And I forgave him. And I kept moving. And I thought, wow, we don't know when our life will be taken. And some would say, well, that's why you shouldn't drive a motorcycle. Look here, it don't matter what you drive. You could drive an army tank truck and still get killed. It don't matter what you're doing. You can get, you could be walking down the street and some demon-possessed person will just shoot you for no reason. Demons don't need a logical motive to attack a child of God. It just happens. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I believe, I really believe with all my heart, not that I'm earning my salvation, but I believe because I, like Noah, I'm doing what God called me to do. I'm doing the will of God, not my will. And because of that, I believe God gave me favor just like he did Noah. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 23. And this right here is theological, biblical proof and evidence that God, he will not destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. 
we will be like we're living in a bubble. And I know that that saying is often in a negative context, but let me tell you, if my life and my salvation is inside of a bubble and not being corrupted when the air is polluted, when there's uh, plagues of diseases, I'll take my happy bubble and I'll move on and I'll be dancing in my bubble. And other people will be dropping with plagues and sickness and diseases, and I'll be praising God in my bubble. I will take a bubble. The Bible says that God will not destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. How do we become righteous? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through seeking and doing God's will. God counts faith with works as done and works with faith as done. This is the blood of Jesus Christ. Really what Jesus is saying is there's, there is no salvation outside of himself. Jesus is saying you can't be saved without me. Jesus is God. Jesus was God. He is God. And he will always be God. And they were saying who can be saved? He's saying with men. With men trying to save themselves it's impossible. But with God. With God. With God all things are possible. Damn.